stream on why choose higher education and making the right choice. First of all, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of our viewers for logging in on YouTube, for logging in on Facebook, because I know there's probably a million and one other things you could be doing right now during this lockdown period. So the fact that you've paused your Amazon, you've paused your, uh, your Netflix to come and join us is really, really wonderful to see. I can assure you the content that we've got prepared for you over this live stream is far more exciting than listening to Joe Exotic slander good old Carol Baskin, okay? So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to my team that I have with me this morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Hello. Hello. Nice and enthusiastic as ever. I'm just gonna do brief <laughs> introductions with everyone in the team. And the first person I wanna start with is our encyclopedia of all things university. It is the one and only Faye Shear. She knows from the smile that we're speaking about her. So good morning, Faye. Your mic. <laughs> we'll Faye, 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 let's retake your mic. <laughs> she can still hear you. Always a good start. Isn't it? <laughs> so we'll go take two, the Encyclopedia of University, not so good on the old uh, stream yard. We've got, uh, we've got Faye yeah. here. <laughs> Technology, you know. Always a winner here. Joining you from my kitchen this morning with some sound. Um, really excited to talk to you this morning about all things higher education. So uh, tune in, ask us some comments, um, say hello. Um, with You don't need to have your mic on to say hello uh, in the comments. Uh, and let us know where you're from as well. What college do you come from? Thank you very much for that. Next up, we're going to go over to the Mr. Trendsetter himself, the epiphany of cool We've got Jamie B. Oh, no, only joking, I'm here. Right, morning, everyone. I um, hope you're doing well. Um, I've worked at DMU and worked in higher education for pretty much all of my career, which, as you can tell, is quite a long time. Um, do apologise for any background noise. My next-door neighbour seems to mobile on every single time we do a live stream. I think he must be logging in deliberately. Um, hope you enjoy it. Hope you find it useful. And as I've said, throw in some questions, and we'll try and tailor the content to meet your needs as we go. Hope you enjoy yourselves, and we'll catch you in a bit. Thank you very much, Jamie. Guys, uh, viewers, I don't know if you've noticed, Jamie's starting to try his own trend out. He's the only one of us to abbreviate his surname. So please log <laughs> into our next live stream to see if that trend catches on. Next up, we've got the Iceman himself, Dave. Hi, everyone. How you doing? So I'm, uh, I'm Dave. So I work um, with these guys in schools and colleges and inquiries now. Um, I'm a former student at DMU as well. I literally finished like two years ago. Um, I've done my undergraduate and postgraduate at De Montfort. So any questions you've got for me when I'm speaking, any questions you've got for everyone else, just pop them in the comments. And yeah, thanks for joining us. And we'll look forward to speaking to you over the next hour as well. Thank you so much, Dave. Now, I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out there. Dave is not Icelandic, so I did call him or refer to him as the Iceman, but I'm sure as we go through this stream, he'll explain as to why I was referring to Ice. Now, that's introductions out of the way, so we're going to crack on to the live stream. Ben, I'm only joking. I haven't uh, forgotten about you, Ben. I haven't forgotten about you, Ben. He was, I saw his face drop a little bit there. Well, you're going to miss me out, Dal. <laughs> yeah. How could I'm you? not too sure what Ben does in our team, guys, but he is Ben. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm just here. I uh, I just come onto these live streams and I talk about university things. Uh, so, yeah, like I say, as the guys have already said, obviously make sure you drop us some questions. Uh, if you're viewing it on the Facebook page, or uh, obviously you can drop your comments below. If you're dropping it on our uh, DMU website, uh, you can click through to YouTube and you can access the comments there. So any questions for these guys, don't ask me any questions. I won't be able to answer them. I'll throw it over to these guys and they'll be able to tell you more about university. Thank you so much. I'm only joking, guys. Ben is an absolute fantastic genius on the old technology. So without further ado, what we're going to do, we're going to continue on with today's live stream. And we've got a great stream prepared for you. And we're going to look at two different aspects. So the first thing that we're going to look at is why you would choose higher education. And then afterwards, we're going to transition into making the right choice. As we know, this could be a very difficult um, circumstance or situation for you guys to go through. The YHE segment is going to be broken down into three streams. Um, so we're going to look at the academic side, we're going to look at the employability side, and we're also going to look at the social side. 
So to kick us off, I'm going to cross over to my best friend in the team. We're going to go over to Ben, and he's going to have a look at YHE Academic. This is going to be a, re a reoccurring theme between uh, myself and Dal, isn't it? Um, okay, so just kicking off with some of the YHE stuff, as Dal has just mentioned. Obviously, if you are thinking of going to university and you are looking at those kind of next steps, university might just be that. That might just be that next opportunity for yourself to carry on that education. So if this is what you're kind of thinking of doing, and this is what we're going to come on to a little bit later, it's worth having a look at what kind of courses are out there and what kind of courses are going to suit you in terms of potentially what career path you want to go into, uh, potentially what obviously uh, area of study that you want to go into. And because there are so many courses out there across the UK at so many different universities, at DMU alone, we have over 400 courses here that you can study. So you really have got a wealth of different options for you that will allow you to go into different areas that you are interested in in studying. So it allows you to really embed yourself as part of the industry through the skills that you learn as part of the course. I think Jamie's going to talk a little bit about the employability side in just a moment. So you really get a bit of a feel for how university is going to be able to kind of get you into a position to get you the job that you want to go into. And it allows you kind of to learn those skills on the job and allows you to get those sort of employability skills to make you as work ready as possible. A lot of the academics that will teach you on a lot of these courses will also be people that have probably worked in industry, they know a little bit about that field, so able to impart that knowledge onto you. So again, you've got the best working chance to get a job uh, when you get that bit of paper at the end of your two, uh, at the end of your three or four years. So it's really important that you think about university like that as the sort of next stages of your education, but don't strictly think of it as just, you know, sitting there, taking notes, doing lectures. It really is allowing you to become more employable so that you're able to kind of get those high level jobs and really get you into the best possible situation. Thank you so much for that, Ben. Guys, anyone else want to contribute to the academic side of YHE? I think from me, I think it's also, you've got to think about the actual enjoyability of the course. People kind of forget about that bit. So you, your course, yes, it gives you all sorts of skills and it prepares you for future life but it should be something you genuinely love as well. You guys have been in education since you were five years old and you've been studying most of the time with very little choice as to what you do. You know, right up until your GCSE, you have no say at all. Your GCSE, you narrow it down a bit. Your A-levels and BTEC, you narrow it down a bit more, but you're picking one degree, one subject. So hopefully you're picking something that genuinely go into class, doing your research, doing your reading. It's something you enjoy doing. So always make sure you factor that bit in when you're picking the course. Dead important. Think about the passion for it. Thank you very much, Jamie B. Faye, Pleasure. the good old encyclopedia. Have they missed anything at? No, I can confirm. Sounded great. <laughs> what an absolute <laughs> cop out. Okay, so the next part that we're going to have a look at is the employability section. Okay, so I think we have Jamie to speak about that. We do. So, um, this is one of the absolute key themes of your whole university career. One of the reasons, one of the primary reasons, yes, you've got the subject. Yes, you've got the social life, which Dave will talk about in a minute, the fun bit. But the, the job at the end of it is the end game you're working towards. That's what you're really investing your money in. So whilst you want to think about a course being enjoyable and a course giving you the right skills, you want to think about leading through to the right job as well. And as an institution at DMU, we do absolutely everything we can to give you the skills and give you the experience to go ahead and get that job. So the employability runs through the whole university experience. You could be a student ambassador, work for the university, get paid, do campus tours, work open days, undertake um, phone calls to potential students to chat about university life. Essentially, talk about yourself and your experience and get paid for it. You could work for Unitemps, our temping agency, and get all sorts of other part-time jobs alongside your course. You could do a gap year with one of our placement teams and get supported to work for a year within your degree. You could do an internship working within the university business areas for a period of time. You could do a graduate champion role or work when you graduate to get more skills. Everything we do is designed to back up the theory you're learning on the course with all of those practical work experience and skills that you get as well. And back in the day, and I am talking back in the day when I did my degree, I did a, a business degree that had two years studying, one year placement and one year back on campus. And I reckon in reality, the most beneficial year and the real one that spurred me on to a career was the work placement. I could have worked, I got two job offers, you may not believe that, I got two job offers, one working at Bitty's the Biscuit Factory and one working at a college that taught further education. 
I chose the college because they paid me more and it was a longer contract. Um, but that year working with them gave me all of those skills and all of those experiences to then get a job working in a university after graduation. So sometimes the placement you do, the experience you get builds up relationships, builds up skills, and that then gives you the platform to build into a degree when you're finished. Um, I know that right now getting work experience is hard. You'd normally be using the summer either before you start uni or before you do your year 13 to get more skills, more experience and earn more money. And this summer, let's face it, ain't going to be the same as other summers. But um, a university would do everything we can to build on those skills you have got. And when it comes to university, if you're thinking, I'm not going to get the experience I need, don't worry about that. We're going to be a lot more flexible with next year's intake to make sure that we're taking into account the tricky situation that you guys are going through with the current COVID-19 situation going on. Back to yourself, Dal, in the studio or wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> in the spare room, we should use. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I want to do before I move on, I just want to bring in the Iceman here. So, Dave, can you talk to us about the employability opportunities that you had whilst you were studying your degree? And did you think that they was going to be available to you in the way that they have? Yeah, of course. I mean, I actually didn't take advantage of the employability sort of opportunities that were out there for me at uni until my final year. It's almost like my first two years because I'd worked for a year before coming to university. I sort of had some money saved up behind me. Um, so I didn't really felt like I needed a job until final year when all of that money had run out. Um, but from there on in, I started realising all the opportunities that are available around you while you're at DMU and any other unis as well. Um, so firstly, I was a front runner during my final year. Um, so the front runner scheme, it offers DMU students the opportunity to work for different areas of the university for 10 to 15 hours a week, it tends to be. Um, so my first one in third year was working for the events team. Um, my undergraduate degree was in arts and festivals management. So that was really helpful and it was a relevant experience as well to be doing while also getting paid while I'm studying as well. So that gave me the money to live on while I was at uni. And then after that, when I went into postgrad, um, so while I was an events front runner, I met lots of student ambassadors who I was sort of um, managing on shifts and then also um, just working with alongside them. Um, so then that gave me the opportunity to potentially become a student ambassador as well. Uh, so then I applied for that. And that was, that was really good as well because it offered extra money for me to while i'm studying especially as a, because i went to postgrad i was a little bit short of cash at that point um but i was still able to improve my empl employability skills sorry uh while working for the university um, and then beyond that once i'd finished um ended up getting a job here at dmu as well um and it also helped me to set up my own business which um, i might, may well talk about a, a little bit more later on as well because i believe we're going to have a whole section of opportunities that university can give you as well um, and alongside this because of setting up that business I also get to, to lecture for the university uh, every now and then as well which is just really does sum up some of the employability skills that you can gain from coming and doing a degree. A real jack of all trades there aren't you uh, Iceman? So I just want to yeah, I just want to say a quick shout out to all of the, uh, the people we've got in the comments. Sanjeev, I do agree. Me, Ben, Dave, Jamie, all have nice beards. Megan, you're probably going to make you looking at the beard, then. I think yours is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah, want to. I just wanted beard. to be a bit modest in there. I didn't want to just assume he was talking to me. Vanessa, I don't quite understand why you love Ben, but yeah, we'll roll with it. Megan, we'll answer your question along with Anzelica at the end of our stream just just to let you know we are receiving your comments and questions and we will address them all if we can at the end of our live stream so the next section that we're going to have a look into is the social aspect and the social side that comes along with going to university fair you're not copying out of this one you're gonna have to speak on this one i'm afraid so would you like to I'm give us a bit about background noise here with the rabbits in the background <laughs> um <laughs> side note um i think what's really important for university is looking at what things that you can get involved in so yes getting a degree is fantastic um, if you move away from home 
you know, gain lots of independent skills and lots of other life skills, you know, from, you know, looking at how, you know, you even manage your bills, for example, how do you pay your rent? Um, but another thing is actually meeting people. And that's something that's really, really um, important as part of your university course. You, you might have known the same people for a long time. You maybe went to primary school with them, secondary school with them, and you might end up going to university where you don't know a single person. And that's exactly what happened to me. I moved three hours away from my hometown. Uh, so have a look at what's going on. Um, I joined a society when I started university. So have a look at DMU alone. We offer over I think, 200 societies now. Uh, they can be sports societies. They can be something to do with your academic studies um, or something completely different. You can join the Bollywood Society, the Harry Potter Society, if you want to. It's just about meeting people, having a good time, you know, having game nights, going out for meals, um, just meeting lots of different friends, having different friendship groups. Um, I don't know about you guys um, in the street. I joined the Latin American and Ballroom Dance Society. I'd never danced before in my life. Wasn't particularly amazing at it, but it was good to uh, get a bit of exercise and fall flat on my face a couple of times also. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't be afraid to just join in. Uh, there is something called Freshers Week. Uh, so that's your first week um, that you're actually on campus as a student, usually just before you start classes as well. So you can go along to your student union. Uh, you can find out what's going on, what sports, what societies are available. Usually there's a couple of demos. You can chat to the people who chair the societies also. Uh, so yeah, that's something to bear in mind. Uh, so lots of different friendship groups that you might make. Um, there's also DMU Global uh, that I want to discuss. So have a look at you know the university that you want to go to. Do they offer international opportunities? Uh, something that we offer, as I mentioned, is DMU Global. That can be an international trip that's part of your course. It could be something that you do as a volunteering opportunity. Uh, it could be that you just have a look to see how you can build up your skills as well. So we do offer scholarships for that. So we're not expecting everybody to be able to afford university life and international travel. So do pop onto our website and have a look at the global opportunities that are involved for your course um, and what funding that we offer for you. Uh, so yeah, that's just some of the things to have a look at, see what is added um, value to your course in your university. Thank you so much for uh, for that, Faye. I know one of the questions that we had when we was taking registrations was around scholarships. So maybe you can uh, give us the answer to that later on in the show. I'm giving you some time now to plan and prep that <laughs> answer because I will be coming to you at the end, Shears, for that scholarship answer. Um, okay. <laughs> ben, Dave, Jamie, anything else to add on the social aspect of university? Not um, one. <laughs> um, with your societies, as Faith just said, obviously you can arrive on campus um, as soon as you sort of start uh, within your sort of first week and there will be a sort of freshers week that will kind of get you uh, to kind of wander around, go and meet lots of different sort of sports teams and societies. Um, myself and Dave were both part of something called Dima Media which was sort of the media society at the university. So uh, I looked after a magazine uh, that was printed across campus every single month. Uh, and myself and Dave both had a radio show on Demon FM, which was at the time broadcasting to all of Leicester. So there's things like that that you can sort of get involved in, as well as some of the other ones that uh, Faye's mentioned, obviously getting involved with uh, some dancing societies. Um, I told somebody about the Salsa Society once, and they thought it was all about eating um, Doritos. It's not. It's the dance that Salsa. Um, <laughs> And there's lots of other things that you can sort of get involved in. You know, um, I happen to know what Dow's favourite society is, um, but I'm going to let him reveal that in a moment. Um, so, the, yeah, there's lots that you can sort of get involved in from that side of things. And you do develop a lot of skills from that. So me being part of that media society, I learned so much about things like media and even things like streaming, which has kind of helped to set stuff like this up. So little skills that you can learn from outside uh, sort of sources and outside of that in terms of those wider opportunities, just add on to, I think, what Faye described as sort of the, the extra opportunities to make up that university package. Ben, I hope you ain't trying to nitpick at the old Harry Potter society. <laughs> I said there's, abs nothing. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that society. If I knew that was the case when I was at university, I would have definitely joined. I love the good old Harry Potter society. <laughs> Dave, Jamie? 
I, I think, I think it's, 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 go on, I'll have to you, Dave. You, you're you're uh, sure I mean, I just... <laughs> One day we'll go with you. Um, yeah, it's pretty much just much the same as what uh, Faye and Ben have both just said as well. Um, I was in a very similar position to Faye when I came to university. I moved from about three and a half hours away. I'm originally from Portsmouth, so I knew absolutely no one in Leicester. Didn't really know a lot about the city either, to be honest. Um, but that's a completely different story. I, I only ever came up to Leicester once. I basically just picked it for the course. Um, well, so when I came up here, I knew nobody. Um, two of my flatmates, I, I, I'm always honest about it, I did get very lucky. I had a really good relationship with my flatmates in the first year. Actually still lived with one of them up until last year. Um, and basically, so two of them were, were best mates from home already. So it just shows that in terms of a social element, you might go out um, or join a society and meet people who have been friends for 10, 15 years, or you might be someone like myself and Faye and you come to university and you know absolutely no one. But either of those are fine. Some people like to come to university and they've already got friends from home who are coming with them. Um, but if you're, you're not like that and you're in the position that myself and Faye were, then there's so many opportunities to meet different people. Um, as Ben said as well about the Dean of Media that I was also a part of with him, um, me and Ben did have that in common that we both didn't study like a media-based course. Quite a lot of people who are in Dean of Media tend to be people who are like media production students. But it's also open for people who don't study media and all of the subjects around that, so say subjects like journalism as well. And um, so one of the reasons why I joined Dean of Media in my second year is because me and my housemate at the time, the same housemate who I lived with up until last year, actually, um, we both done, so he actually studied dance and I studied us, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, and neither of us had anything to do with sort of the media, but it was sort of one of those where, as I joined university, I did think, you know, what, I would have loved to have maybe picked a course that was more to do with the media, because I'd love to do something like presenting on the radio or the TV or something like that. Um, so it gave me all of the experience of doing that, um, having my own radio show, TV. Um, I got involved in some filming and stuff as well. And I just always say on the, on the social element of, of university, you are only at university once, so just chuck yourself in and get involved with everything possible because I didn't start getting involved with uh, more than until my second year and it's one of those that when I look back I probably regretted not getting involved with it sooner because it was probably like the societies and stuff that I joined were the best part of my university experience so I do wish that I'd done that sooner to be honest. Thanks for that Dave. Jamie? Best years of my life, mate, looking back, you know, looking back longingly. That's half the problem with this job. You look back, all you guys watching this, you've got those experiences in front of you. Genuinely take advantage of every single opportunity. I'm from a little tiny village where not much happened, moved away to quite a decent-sized town for university, and it was socially the best three years I've ever had. You've got the mates you live with in your hall of residence, so I live with a flat with five guys who were literally from all over the place. They were from Yorkshire, Northern Ireland, London via France, it was quite complicated, Nigeria and Brunei, which is a place I'd never even heard of, gave me a map and a pin, it'd be a bit like a pin the tail on a donkey, I've no idea. So, and we all lived together, then I made mates on my social life from, I joined societies, I did tennis, I did temping bowling, and then I made loads of mates on the course as well. So you've got these kind of three or four different streams to your lifestyle, and it's all about balancing those parts, balancing the work. So someone's asked the question about part-time work, can you work enough to pay for your halls? You can, but we recommend you try and balance your work with the other aspects of your life. Hey, good timing. If all you do is work, 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 one, you might not get time to focus fully on the course, which is what you're paying for. And two, you might not get time to have a social experience as well. So the social scene, in fact, university generally, it's all about balance and commitment of your time. It's committing enough to the social to have those memories and have a great time, enough to the earning to cover some of your extra living costs to supplement your loans and enough towards the course to make sure you maximise the fees you're putting in and get the best grades out at the end of it. If you can balance it and juggle those things, and the first year is all about finding the balance, second and third year is then pushing on to maximise those skills you've gained in year one. But genuinely, I look back and I think, oh my God, it's amazing. And I was talking to one of my mates last night who I met right in that first term, and you've still got so many stories to reminisce with because you're all in that melting pot all at the same time. I'm dead jealous that you guys have got this in front of you. I could be a mature student perhaps next year. I could be an option. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you for that, <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> Guys, oh, that's cool. but you're, you know, you just... <laughs> <laughs> right, so Joseph, Megan, Charlie, Artif, we have received your comments um, and your questions. We will re uh, read out most of those at the end of the show. Guys, just a quick reminder, keep them coming through and hopefully we'll be able to get those um, answered for you at the, at the end of our live stream. Hopefully that's covered YHE. And just to recap, we have looked at that from three perspectives. We've looked at it from the academic side. We've looked at it from the employability side. And we've also looked at the social aspect as well in terms of what things you could expect when coming to university. Now on to the second half of our live stream. And it's all around making the right choice. You guys are in a position where if, you, if this were a shop, if this was a sweet shop, as I love sweets, there is millions and millions and millions, well, not literally, but there is a lot of, <laughs> there is a wide variety of choice that you guys have in regards to course, in, in regards to the university itself. And, and I've been fortunate enough to teach at two different universities, and it's been exactly the same content that I've taught. And sometimes I often wonder, well, how do students differentiate between the two? How do we get from one to the other when everything looks so similar? Going back to my sweet analogy, guys, apps, my team absolutely love my analogies, by the way. <laughs> it is just the same suite with different rappers. So it's all about picking the most attractive rapper. I hope you're following me, guys. Does that make sense? I think so. <laughs> oh, cheers, Ben. <laughs> okay, it's so what we're going to do... Even, even though you're distant earlier, it's still got your back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do now, the first part of making the right choice for us always comes down to research. So I believe we're going to go over to Ben to have a look at the research process. Okay, so um, in terms of research, like Dal said, there are so many different courses out there. And I think I mentioned that at the top, you know, there's lots of lots and lots of different courses, lots and lots of different universities. So really, that research needs to be, you need to start as early as possible. And again, we appreciate that, obviously, during this uh, lockdown at the moment, it is a, a little bit difficult to try and get those to, to get some of those open days, maybe speak to some of those academics to actually talk to, you know, current students, and which is why we're doing some of these live streams now to try and make it a little bit easier and give you some of that information as best we can. Um, and of course, there will be uh, digital open days and that sort of thing available to you, which will give you some dates for towards the end. But in terms of why it's important to look at that research. And this was something that Jamie highlighted earlier. We're not just looking at the course, which obviously Dan has highlighted there. We're talking about why there are so many different courses out there. And yes, some will have uh, you know similar modules and sim similar topics that you'll cover between a couple of different universities. So that's why you need to look at it broader and look at some of those opportunities that we've just mentioned. So look at things like societies, look at some of the travel opportunities uh, that we were talking about a little bit earlier as well. So you've got to make sure that you're having a look at all those kind of wider involvement in terms of the university as well you can start to look at things like the accommodation which we'll come on to so where are you going to be staying if you are going to be in a situation like Dave and Faye where you're going to be moving three hours away you're going to be living in a brand new city well you've got to make sure that you're happy with where you're moving to so that should make a part of your research as well so there's quite a lot of things that you need to start considering when it comes to that sort of research my best advice from a top level when you're starting to look at the particular course is having a look at things like the UCAS website because you're able to then actually go, okay, um, I'm interested in doing a maths course, let's say, or a business course. You can go onto the UCAS website, type it in, and that will start to show you which universities offer those kinds of courses. You're able to then kind of go into those universities and that's when you're able to look into more about the accommodation, the wider opportunities, the societies, maybe have a look at the facilities, looking at all of those kind of wider things within that research that you're able to get a best picture that you can about that university and about that course. And you're not in a situation where you're going, oh, okay, I'll just do this business course and I'll go there and it'll be fine because we do have a lot of students that might end up in a situation where that we've spoken to doing these live streams and uh, some of the conversations that we've had where they've kind of picked their university they've not really done that much research they've got there they've enjoyed it for a few months and gone actually this isn't really for me or we've had other situations where students have gone along to different open days and they've said yeah this had a really nice vibe to it but this one maybe not so much so the research that you do if you're in year 12 at the minute is going to make up it is going to be really important for those next sort of steps because you are literally going to be committing to that for a few years so make sure you are looking at it as much as you can and again we know it's difficult during the lockdown at the minute but you are committing a bit of time to it just having a little look just seeing what courses are out there and just seeing what universities are out there thank you ben guys any other tips you want to give out for research or anything that students should be considering when researching 
Yeah, I'd always just say like um, to make sure that the choice that you do make is is going to be a course that you 100% know that you want to do and you're going to feel happy doing for the next few years. Um, to cut a long story short, I always say this when I'm speaking to people who are researching about courses. I Before I took a gap year, I did initially apply for universities because um, I guess I sort of felt a little bit pressured into it but that's, that's a different story now I, I I didn't necessarily want to go to university at that stage and I didn't know what courses I wanted to do um, so I initially applied for religious studies um, which is a complete opposite to what I would have wanted to do it's purely because I've done it at a level and I thought I was good at it and when it came down to sort of oh you should you should think about university uh, from my college at the time I purely just picked a course that I thought I'd be good at, um, which I then obviously ended up regretting because when it came round to it and I had five offers from different universities to study things like religious studies, I just took one look at it and I just thought, I, I can't do that for the next three, four years of my life. So I turned all the offers down, done my research over the next year, and I finally found uh, DMU and Arts Festivals Management. So I just always make sure that when you are researching, don't just necessarily think about something that you're going to be good at. Think about something that you know you're going to love and something that you're really going to want to dedicate three years of your life to, maybe even four to five years of your life to, because, you know, you don't want to obviously get to university and then feel like um, it, it's a course that you don't actually want to study. So research is literally the most important part of it, really. Dave, the philosopher, who would have known, eh? Get <laughs> No? Yeah, yeah, I think one thing for me is um, don't let the fact you're not in school or college stop you with the research. It's dead easy for all of us to think that kind of life is on pause during this period when we can't go anywhere and do anything and you haven't got your teachers kind of chasing you around and giving you tasks in the same way as you normally had. I can hear my eight-year-old daughter downstairs having arguments about maths homework, you know, so make sure you still take the initiative still do your research and use digital platforms so we've got a digital open day coming up in a few weeks you've got platforms like the student room um you can go onto our website and watch more of these live streams you can talk to our current students one-to-one -one. just be proactive so that if school doesn't reopen till september you don't want to be in a position when suddenly university applications are right there and you haven't thought about it at all so make sure you use this time you've got now to think about it to get online and do some research so that when you do get back into school and college, you're in a position to actually get best foot forward and it doesn't come as a massive shock and a panic through the autumn term. It's dead important because it's a really, really big decision. And it's a decision that will impact you short, medium and long term. It impacts who you meet, what job you do, what money you earn. So do genuinely make sure that you proactively own your own journey, particularly during this period when school and college can't kind of heard you to do that research to so do be proactive thank you so much jamie so the oh, next pleasure. aspect that we're going to look at is open days and rumor has it our encyclopedia went to over 20 different open days Faye, do you want to you just share a bit more detail to that she just likes to travel <laughs> I had a sister who went to university before me, so I went on all the open days with my sister when she was looking, and then I went on more open days when I was looking two years later. So that's kind of how it probably totted up to about 20 open days. I didn't tell um, your family end up going to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, brother, my sister, me, we all ended up at the same university at the same time. Funny. Great, great research, um, that. So, yeah, um, go and visit universities once you can. It's a great way of finding out um, how, how it feels to you. So sometimes it's just you feel a vibe when you go to a university. Um, once uh, my dad actually drove me and a friend four hours to see a university. And when I got there, I was like, no, not for me. Let's go back. But these days we're really, really lucky in that we can actually see a lot more online. There's a lot more available to us. So you can actually go onto websites. So, for example, the De Montfort University website has a virtual campus tour. Um, so once you have decided 
which course you want to do, what universities offer it, whereabouts in the country you want to be. Start looking at the campus. Does it have the right feel? What does it look? Where, which building will you be studying in, for example? So have a look at our virtual campus tour, uh, start kind of finding your way around campus, see what it looks like. Um, and then also you can book on to digital open days now. So if you want to speak to some academics, speak to some students, speak to people like me, uh, you can come along to our digital open day on Saturday the 4th of July. Hopefully I've got that right, it's from the top of my head. Um, so you know, speaking to academics, speaking to students, they're going to tell you what to expect from the campus, what to research when looking at accommodation, uh, what kind of opportunities are available outside of your studies. You're going to find that out by actually speaking to students um, and getting their first hand experience. Thank you so much for, the, uh, for that, Faye. Anyone else want to comment around open days? Yeah, don't let the fact they're digital put you off getting involved because they're still the best way of getting a flavour for the uni, meeting the students, meeting the staff, seeing in the halls. So yes, it's probable you can't physically get to a university campus to be autumn, but definitely, definitely, definitely do the online stuff because it will give you a massive boost in terms of the impression as to what each university is like. And you'll see how much accommodation they have, how much the accommodation costs, and just gives you a flavour of the whole thing. So do get involved pre-summer. Otherwise, like I said, you'll be chasing your tail in September, trying to do everything at like warp speed. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Jamie. Jamie, we're going to stick with you now because what we want to discuss is the course. So we want to have a look at some of the considerations that students want to have to, uh, will have to think about when picking their course. This is probably your primary point to research. Most people, when they come to us at an event, the first question they ask is, do you do X course? What's the course like? I can see in the questions Artif has asked about accounting and finance. And what you need to do is you need to genuinely, first of all, decide broadly on the subject you want to do. So I was torn between history and English. History I really enjoyed and I got a passion for. History, I mean, I'm lying. History and business, what am I saying? So I thought I, I got a passion for history, but I could see that business was going to tangibly give me a work placement, give me some income and take me on to a very definitive path. So I ended up choosing the business. So if you're torn between two different things, first top tip is do the research at top level and work out which course you want to do and why. Don't try and edge your bets, otherwise you'll produce a really complicated and confusing application and personal statement. Then, once you've narrowed your course down, you've got to work on the small print. So Artif's asked about accounting and finance. You've got to look at the modules. What's the module like on accounting and finance course at DMU versus an accounting finance course elsewhere? Look at things like um, placements. We offer a full year placement on that course. Perhaps some universities don't. Look at accreditations. So again, an accounting and finance degree with ourselves will minimise the exams you have to take after graduation. Perhaps other universities might not be the same. So you've got to read the small print. How many people are on the course? Is it 300 people in a lecture theatre? Or a small number, like Dave's Arts and Festivals, would be a much smaller number of people, and you get to know every single person on the course. Is it assessed by exams or assignments or presentations? Do you have lectures? Is it more hands-on? You just have to read the small print. There might be 200 degrees called BSc in psychology. You've got to work out what's important to you, read the detail and narrow it down from there. So my course, my business degree, I had about 15 hours a week on campus in a busy week, probably 10 hours a week on campus in a quiet week. So you've got loads of time in that course to work part time, socialise, get plenty of kip, you know, quite a lot of um, no alarm clock mornings. My housemate did chemical engineering. He had 37 hours a week in class. So his basic student lifestyle was massively, massively different. So do physically have a look um, and make sure that you physically sort of read those details and get in from there. Because every single course and every single university is genuinely different. And you've got to get down to the depth below the surface to really find out where those differences are. And of course, the grades as well. If you're predicted straight A's, literally every single university is yours to pick from. If you're predicted three C's, still loads of universities to go to, you've got to be a bit realistic and try and match yourself into where it is you want to go and make sure that it fits you in every single way. It's all about the research, as Ben said before. Thank you very much. Faye, Ben, Dave, anything else to contribute? One at a time, fighting over it. <laughs> fighting over it. 
Um, I think it's to tie, I guess, into to something that Jamie said again. That that research is really important, but there are very often sort of like niche courses within those areas that you can sort of look at as well. Um, so as we mentioned before, it's just quick one at the top. Use the UCAS website. Type in anything you like on the UCAS website. It will tell you what courses are on offer at what universities. Um, you can literally type in. Uh, anything i mean if you type in the word cheese as a dairy farming course in portsmouth for instance um i think no way really? yeah apparently and there's also a circus studies course in portsmouth as well they've got all the weirdest courses um, I at home. <laughs> yeah, that's where so, game's from isn't it it's hometown <laughs> Dave looks like he'd be great for the uh, circus studies course, actually. Um, but yeah, so there's loads and loads of stuff out there. So it might be that you're thinking, actually, there's not really any courses that are right for me at this stage. But if you are thinking, well, actually, I've got this really weird interest in like circus studies or Viking studies or Harry Potter studies, because we've all seen that on like Facebook and stuff, you know, go and have a look on the UCAS website. Just see what is on offer because it will tell you exactly what kind of modules are cropping up here, there and everywhere. You're likely to find something that's going to interest you um, and you'll be able to obviously find where that course can then take you. One thing I want to tip back in again, sorry, is the parent relationship when it comes to courses. Some of you might have parents who've got a particular thought as to what course and what job you might do your job is to to work with them and engage with them so if you want to do something and perhaps your parents think you want to do something else you need to have those conversations and try and sell the virtues of the course you want to do not all graduate jobs need a definitive course so all of us now in this chat we all now work in pretty much the same career path but every single one of us did a different course now i did a business degree and uh, faded languages ben did his it um Dave did his arts and festivals, and now we all do the same job. So don't necessarily get hung up on the fact that a particular course leads to a particular job. The transferable skills you get, the experience you get, prepares you for all sorts of different careers. But obviously, you can't do a drama course and go on to be a brain surgeon. But in the case of most careers, there are lots and lots and lots of flexibility in terms of how you go from A to B, from your degree to your job. Coolio, spoken like a true parent there, Jamie. Um, <laughs> yeah, not, not, that, not that the kids listen, but you know, you've got, you've got to say it, even if you know it's going straight in one ear and out the other, you've still got to say it. Okay, cool. What we're going to do now, we're going to cross over to Dave um, and we're going to take a real student focus for the next couple of sections. Um, the first section that, that we want to have a look at is accommodation. Now, I know from reading the comments, there have been quite a few questions around accommodation, and we'll try and pick up on those as we go through. So, Dave, I'm just going to hand over to you to give us a brief. Um, overview around accommodation yes i mean with accommodation again it's one of those where research is very important because there's nowadays especially there's loads of accommodation available so you can go and stay in the place that sort of suits you now especially here at dmu even when i started five six years ago um there wasn't as many options for um sort of self i can't even think of the word now um your your own flat um sorry so that sorry i made a bit of a mistake there uh couldn't remember the word um but basically there's quite a lot of options now here at dmu where you can actually just have your own self-contained flat so it'll have like um a bathroom a kitchen a living room and a bedroom in it there's lots of options of things like that now so if you're someone who moving to university is a big step because you might not want to share a kitchen share a living room share a bathroom there's options there for you as well and the majority of students do move into what we call shared accommodation so they can be shared halls there's lots of different options for these as well and all of them will have sort of differing price ranges um so the majority of these you you tend to sort of share a kitchen and living space between five or six people that's, that's sort of what it tends to be in, in the majority of them um, and quite a lot of them now as well will have an ensuite bathroom. Again, this is where the price ranges do come in. If you are happy to share a bathroom, then you can get accommodation that is a little bit cheaper. If you are somebody who does want their own bathroom and an ensuite in your bedroom, then you might pay a little bit more for that. But you do tend to now just pay more for more sort of modern rooms. Um, to be honest, especially here at DMU, I would say 80% of our halls, that's that's not an actual stat, um, but probably somewhere around 80%, um, 
do have ensuite bathrooms and stuff now, um, you might just pay a little bit more for sort of a room that's newer. So I know that one of our accommodations, it's very, very nice. Um, it's Glassworks, for example. It's literally a minute away from the campus. Um, I think it only opened three or four years ago. So it's, all the rooms are very modern. Um, so you, that's one of our more expensive halls. Whereas the ones that still have an ensuite bathroom, still have the shared kitchen and living space, but have maybe been here for a little bit longer, um, they tend to be a little bit cheaper than, say, Glassworks now. Um, the only difference I can really think of at the top of my head is that some of our accommodation is owned and managed by De Montfort directly. Um, so that includes Bead Hall and uh, New Wharf. So they're some of the halls of residence where you do share a bathroom. Um, they can be a little bit cheaper than the private accommodation, which tend to have on suite bathrooms and stuff as well. But if you're listening to me um, jabber on right now and you're actually thinking, I don't really want to stay in shared accommodation, there's always the opportunity for you to look into private accommodation while you're at university as well. And we do have our own um, in house, well, the, the Students' Union does, um, letting agents called Sulets who can help you find any accommodation that you might need as well. Cheers, thank you. Um, anything else from you guys around accommodation? I think what a lot of um, students do after their first year is do a, similar to what Dave's just mentioned about Sulex is they tend to go and look private. Once you've made some friends um, after your first year, you've made some friends in your course or from your society, uh, a lot of people will then move into like a shared house. And again, because we're quite fortunate to be uh, quite close to a city centre where we're based at DMU, uh, there's quite a lot of sort of housing estates dotted around and you find that they are predominantly just students just run the place, you know, they rent every house in a street. Um, so you can imagine it's always, there's always quite a lot of people around, there's lots of students around and everything. So it's quite good fun. And that's what a lot of students will do in their sort of second year. You do find that going private that way, uh, you get a bit more of that university experience outside of the halls. But generally, um, first years will tend to go into accommodation just because it's easier. It's all kind of managed by the university. And then if you want to, you can stay in the accommodation. And some unit, some students will actually go back into accommodation for their third year just because it's a little bit closer to campus or it's slightly easier for them to kind of get to accommodation. So you can kind of mix it, uh, mix and match how you like. But yeah, first year, generally go into accommodation, get mixed with a bunch of new people, as Jamie mentioned earlier, uh, meet lots of people that way. And then obviously you can choose what you do as you move through your university career. Cheers. Thanks for that. We, ben. Get, but, we so get a lot more people, actually, for the last couple of years, we get a lot more students who mm. sort of, go to a university within like an hour of where they live. So quite a lot of students, but live at home in year one and then move into shared housing with some mates in year two or live in halls in year one and then move back home to save some cash in year two. There's so many different ways of doing university. It's all just about finding out, like we've said before, what is the best fit for you academically, socially, financially and accommodation wise. You know, it's all about making those personal choices, but there's lots and lots and lots of different ways of doing it. And someone's asked a question about term starting in September. Um, as as we currently stand, we hope to be able to teach fully on campus in September um, as per normal. But obviously, we are completely, utterly reliant on government information, best practice from there. So it might be that we open in September. We have social distance in place. It might be term starts slightly later. It might be there's some digital interactions. There's all sorts of... Um, of different engagements going on there. So keep your eye on, on both the government picture and individual university comms regarding exactly how this September will look. Thank you for that, Jamie. Whilst you started the questions, we might as well go through them. So we've got Megan. Hey, hey, Megan. Um, in Peterborough, just, ex uh, just been accepted into DMU. I'm excited to start in September, hopefully, but I'm not sure how to look into private accommodation as I have to get it for a personal reason. I want to get a part-time job, but also wonder whether the loan would cover it and where would I start? Thank you, and I hope you're all keeping well and safe. We are. We hope you're keeping well and safe as well, Megan. So, guys, does anyone want to have a go at taking and answering that three-part, two-part question? Yes, I mean, um, with where the private accommodation um, is in mind, I definitely recommend getting in contact with Sue Let's who we mentioned a minute ago, uh, because they essentially a letting agent that the SU sort of sort of like run um, but they can get you in touch with local landlords um, so my house in third year was actually through Sulets and I lived there with a few friends um, but there's lots of accommodation which will allow you to sort of live on your own as well but I would definitely recommend getting in touch with Sulets as well uh, 
Ben did help me out in the end with the word studio flats. Um, and I do know that Sue Let's do actually have their own um, studio flat. Um, I think it's about five, ten minutes from campus. There's quite a lot of uh, studio flats in there. So definitely have a word with them about that. Um, when it comes to student finance, student finance can be a, a little bit tricky because it can depend on your household income. So that's the household that you live in now, whether that's with parents or partners. Um, so essentially, student finance will calculate your household income and then they will essentially let you know um, whether or not you how much sort of funding you can access. So for myself personally, um, my student loan did cover my accommodation because I come from a lower income um, family. Other people, they might need sort of family to, to maybe help them out sometimes because they can't access the full loan, which means it it doesn't quite cover the full accommodation fee. But in most cases, student finance does tend to cover the full accommodation costs. Um, there, of course, can be uh, situations where it doesn't, um, but lots of students, what they do in that case is they, they get part-time work to help them fund their accommodation and then just towards the cost of living as well. Um, and, and we can talk about that a little bit later on as well, but we do have things that are also based in the SU Builder, such as Unicamp. So if you are looking part-time work while you need to help towards the cost of accommodation and stuff i definitely recommend getting in touch with them as well thank you so much i'm just keeping track of time as well we're going to quickly push on um very quickly guys is part-time student jobs enough to pay your student accommodation anyone want to quickly try and answer this one you'd usually go with a blend of the student loan so we'd recommend taking the loan when it's available to you because it does give you that basic amount of money and then the average student works 10 or 15 hours a week probably average any more than 15 hours a week and you're starting like we said earlier to stretch the balance of time too much towards work and missing out on other aspects so i would say that use a combination of your loan and the part-time work is more than enough to cover your rent your bills and your social life and then it's balancing my income and making sure you have a great time, but at the same time, you don't go completely mad when your student loan comes in and you budget yourself through the month. First term, you learn a lot of budgeting skills. By year two, you're normally pretty savvy. So time management and financial management are two of the big skills. But yeah, work part-time contributes a lot towards your halls, but usually supplemented by your loan and any savings you've got from the summer, Christmas, Easter work you've got as well. Thank you for that, Hen. Thank you. Well, by the way. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we're going to carry on with our stream now. And the next topic that we're going to cover is opportunities. So, Dave, can you talk to us a bit about the opportunities that you'll get studying at university? So, firstly, I'll actually start with a bit of advice. Um, and, and that is the opportunities that you can get at university are endless. You just have to put in a little bit of work to sort of go out there and take them. Um, I think I did mention earlier that for my first year, I'd probably focused a little bit too much on the social side, not that that's a bad thing, um, with the opportunities at university. But then in second and third year, and then masters as well, I threw myself in and got involved with all the opportunities that are possible. Um, one of the biggest ones, I think Faye mentioned it very briefly earlier, that is offered at DMU, is DMU Global. Now, for myself, I, I did mention a second ago as well, um, I'm not necessarily from a very high income background so I've never been able to travel that much um, until I came to DMU um, and then DMU Global really helped me to be able to sort of go out and see areas of the world that I didn't think I'd be able to um, the biggest example of that is when I got to go to New York which was three years ago now I think um, so I think I was 21 then and um, I never thought I'd be able to go to New York at 21 years old. And the way that the DMU Global Scheme works is that the university gives you some money towards going on these abroad trips. And um, they tend to either be mass trips or academic led trips. Now, there is a small difference between the two. The academic led trips tend to be just you with your course. Um, so for example, when I was studying on arts and festivals management, which is a much smaller group of students, we went to Amsterdam in second year, which was part of a research trip because we were doing a comparison report between um, the way they do cultural policy in Amsterdam and the way they do it in Leicester. Um, so that was an amazing experience. It was a little bit more structured in terms of we had lots of meetings to go to and stuff and the interesting thoughts were meeting with cultural organisations in the city. Um, whereas the mass trips, 
they tend to just be a little bit different because you have a little bit more freedom. But there are still lots of things that are led by your um, faculty and your course that are sort of, you know, structured somewhere in New York because I was an art specialist manager. We went to visit like Rock City and Madison Square Garden so we could see how they operate as well. Uh, but I mean, there's so many opportunities out there. If you're somebody who knows that you want to maybe work while you're studying as well, you can look into placement years. This allows people to earn while they're studying, but then also gain enough relevant work experience is really going to help them once they finish university. Um, some courses, placement years are encouraged more than others, um, but then there's always the option to do a placement year. So I didn't personally do one, um, but it's again one of the things that when I look back, I sort of do think maybe if I'd done university again, I would probably do a placement year just because it's such an amazing opportunity to improve your employability skills and get paid and take a year out of uni as well. Cool. Thank you so much for that, Dave. Um, guys, rest of the team, anything else you'd like to add on to that? Um, I'll jump in very quickly again. I think the, the biggest opportunity I took from university was the was the society. So I'm not going to go too much into that, so we're not repeating ourselves, but definitely find out what societies, what sports teams you can sort of join. Um, one of the global trips that I did when I was a student a few years ago was through Dimmer Media, and we went to New York. So you can just even just from that, similar to what Dave was mentioning about, you get these bursaries, they'll send you on these trips to go and do various uh, different things. They can come from societies. One of my favorite stories from that is that there is a society called Street Law and their whole thing is sort of teaching law to people that maybe don't necessarily study law so they kind of teach it in a slightly more sort of layman's terms one of the things they were doing is they were teaching law to kids in schools by putting disney villains on trial which i thought was brilliant so it was part of their research what they were doing is they were they asked dmu global if they could go to disneyland paris and dmu global said yeah, sure, why not? So just stuff like that is just really good fun. It's a bit silly, but you get a lot of those kind of wider opportunities kind of kind of, kind of going that route as well. So yeah, things like that, you can just get involved at university and have a lot of fun with it, but you do also get to kind of build on a lot of those skills that you're learning. Cool. Anything else, guys? Are you happy for me to move on? Nods of everyone. There you Thank go. You very much. Okay, so the final aspect of our live stream today is the city slash location. As you've probably worked out, there are a number of accents on our live stream this morning. Obviously, I have the best one because I come from the <laughs> best city. I'm only joking. Um, it's entirely up to you guys wherever you guys. Where from Liverpool again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the Sky Saxon coming through, is it? <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. You can't suppress it for long, <laughs> The city and location is often a big factor for most of you to consider. So we're just going to cross back over to Dave again because he came from Portsmouth all the way over to Leicester. And we just want a, a bit of insight around some of the challenges that you might have faced or why was it that you chose Leicester as your university destination? Yes, I mean, one of the main reasons why I picked to come to De Montfort and Leicester is that we do have one major advantage and that's basically that De Montfort is a city centre campus uni. So essentially you get the best of both worlds at De Montfort. Um, I won't mention many other names, um, but some other universities that you might visit um, or, or maybe sort of you know, go to just visit friends, you notice that there is it, it tends to be a little bit strained on the social side and the things that you can do while you're studying as well. And that's purely because it's based on a campus that is, you know, maybe like half an hour away from a city or maybe half an hour away from a town where not much is sort of going on anyway. Um, being from Portsmouth, I think I was quite keen to stay in sort of a city environment. Um, and I know that a lot of people who come from somewhere a bit quieter are very keen to move to a city because there is more to do and you don't have to travel too far in order to do those things um, a lot of people who I met at university did come from this sort of background where they sort of grew up somewhere and they have to get like a bus or a train or a lift from their parents into the nearest city in order to sort of do anything um, but that is basically 
what I always actually say for me was the biggest selling point about De Montfort is the fact that the whole campus is together. So you're never any further than five minutes away from another building on campus, but you're literally five minutes away from the city centre as well. And that means as well, because all the accommodation is actually built around the campus, that you actually live five minutes away from campus, but also five minutes away from the city centre. It really is the best of both worlds. You can be from your lecture into a bowling alley or something like that within five minutes of finishing and you can literally hop out of bed at um, five minutes to nine if you if you wanted to and uh, be in your lecture it's, it's a brilliant location and it, it's really handy to have everything all on that campus cheers thank you so much for that dave um guys ben Faye, jamie anything else around the city and location i am um, didn't study in leicester um and I decided to move here about five years ago. And one of the reasons for that was because it is the kind of place where you don't necessarily need to have a car. You can get around quite easily on foot, uh, but there's also lots of job opportunities here as well. So if you're looking for somewhere where you could study, and then quite easily find a job as well. There's lots of um, great opportunities, uh, you know, job prospects, um, lots, you know, you're in the heart of the country. It's easy to get anywhere from here. Thank you for that, Faye. Jamie? Ben? No, but literally from, from Leicester train station, which you can walk to from the campus, you're in central London at St Pancras in, or St Pancreas as the daughter calls it, you're in central London in an hour. And you can be driving and be in Manchester an hour and 45 minutes. You can be in Birmingham in 45 minutes to an hour. Really central location, amazing train links, right on the M1. It's a great place to be in terms of being able to be a decent commute from lots of people, but accept accessible to lots of places as well. So it genuinely is a great location. And it's a, it's a nice city. You can walk everywhere. There's two universities in town, ourselves plus one whose name I forget, and genuinely it creates a really, really, really good student buzz within the city centre during term time. More than 10% of town is the student population during the student academic year. It's great. Excellent. Ben, we don't want to hear what you have to say on city and location. We're going to go straight over to the Q&A. That's fine. <laughs> right, yeah, this time. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions to get through. Um, the first one, whilst we're on the um, topic of Leicester and DMU, Joseph is asking, what is it like starting at the Montford University? Anyone want to have a quick bash at answering this? I think me and Dave started very similar sort of time, so we can take a stab at it. I can go first if you like. Yeah, sure. If you have to, Ben, if you have to. Me and you are going to fall out eventually, aren't we, Dan? <laughs> um, just, uh, just quickly, as I mentioned before, obviously you get quite a, a nice sort of a welcome weekend and a welcome week where they'll put on a lot of the sort of activities that will allow you to kind of meet lots of uh, lots of people. And that includes that sort of freshers week where you can go and sign up for lots of uh, societies and sports teams. So it's a really good that they try and sort of in, uh, get you into the sort of community atmosphere. The Students' Union tends to put on a lot of sort of activities. And again, there's a lot of nighttime events um, that you can sort of go along to. Uh, there's a bit of a nightclub at the top of the SU, which again is central to campus. So lots of nighttime events. There's lots of trips to lots of different places. So there's lots and lots to sign up for when uh, Freshers Week sort of kicks off. So if we are your firm choice, the closer you kind of get to starting with us in September, providing everything goes back to normal, uh, you'll get a lot of that information. You'll be able to kind of start purchasing a lot of those tickets to kind of join in with a lot of the activities. And like I say, if you're moving into accommodation, um, again, you'll make friends that way. So it is good. It is nice. And I say the community atmosphere and the sort of quite, quite close knit sort of campus means everything sort of nearby, as Jamie mentioned, easy to walk to. So I think it's good. It's good sort of uh, it's a good sort of starting point when you get to university. Dave? Yeah, I mean, if I'm totally honest, and I'm sure there's lots of other people out there who felt the same. Of course, at first, it is a little bit scary. Um, I'm somebody who's actually really confident. Um, I remember being in the car, my mum and grandma on the way to uni, and I was so confident, you know, I was just looking forward to it. But then the second all of your bags are dropped off and you're on your own, you, you are a little bit like, oh, what to do now? Um, but honestly, everyone apart from the- You know what you wanted to say there, Dave, but you couldn't do, because it's- <laughs> 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 It, it does turn out to be like the the best time of your life. I mean, it is a little bit scary at first, but 
as I was saying, everyone's in the same boat. You just um, get out there and you meet lots of people in the exact same situation as you. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it can be a little bit scary and it's totally normal to feel nervous before you start university. If you do, don't worry about that feeling. Everyone goes through it, even people who have got so much confidence and um, everyone feels a little bit nervous before they start uni. But as Ben was saying, there's so many events and stuff to make you feel more comfortable and to meet lots of people in the exact same position as you. The only thing I would always recommend at starting at any university or starting at DMU is to just get yourself involved straight away because the best way to do it is, is to just make as many friends as possible, I'd say. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the question, Joseph. Uh, next up, we have Charlie. And they are asking, is time management hard at uni? Yeah, it, it's the same skills as you're using now, Charlie, in school or college. Because even at school, you've still got to balance in the evening when you do your homework, when you work part time, when you go out socially, when you go online, when you're on your phone, when you're gaming. So it's just a, a next step up from that because you've got a lot more independence with that management and you're managing a bit more cash as well, which frees up more stuff. But essentially, it's just building on the same skills you've delivered over the last couple of years. You know, it's just balancing those different elements and also sensing if you think you're going to go too much in one way. So Dave mentioned his first year was a bit social. Mine was a lot social, I think, in a similar way. But over the summer, when I looked at my grades and I looked at sort of what I was doing, I reevaluated and, and improved in year two. So it's constantly learning but it's also building on those skills you've already got and it's juggling all those different aspects of your student experience day by day. Thank you for that. Hope that's answered your question, Charlie. Artif has posted two or three questions, so I'm just going to try and combine this into one for you guys. The first question is, easiest way to um, find a part-time job? And the second question is, how will you find a placement on a degree? So I think the easiest way to find a part-time job is definitely for uni temps, to be honest. Um, so I was a student ambassador here, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and if you get in contact with them, they don't just have, you know, jobs that represent the university. They also, as a recruitment agency, have lots of jobs that are in the local area. But also, one of the other easiest ways, that I've got a lot of friends who sort of did work in retail while they're studying as well, is to literally... Um, High Cross Shopping Centre, it's a huge shopping centre complex, it's about five minutes away from the campus as well. Just take your CV in, hand them around the shops and they'll definitely let you know if they do need any um, staff. But I would say um, Uni Temps is definitely the main one just because it is literally an, an in-house recruitment agency. Um, and in regards to the placement question as well, Another amazing thing about university is that DMU does have a in-house placement team for every single faculty. So if you are looking at doing a placement and you're a business and management student, you'll have the business and law placements team that will help you to tailor your CV, tailor your cover letter, and they'll help you with interview practice as well, as well as assessment centre practice. So it can be difficult, of course, to find a placement because placements are very competitive. Um, they're just as competitive as sort of jobs are, but all of the help and support that you need is available to you at university as well. And the team will help you every single step of the way from application to the final interview on your placement. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Artif. The next question that we have up is from Anisu. My apologies if I've said your name wrong. Uh, can you choose if you want to stay with just girls or just guys in halls? You can. M most of the halls in most unis tend to be single sex flats, often in mixed sex buildings. But if you do want to live with a combination of guys and girls rather than just, you know, your own gender, there is usually the option to do that as well. So, yeah, mixed sex is less common, but it's still possible as well. But single sex is the norm, but you can adapt from that if you want. So just again, like everything else, there's lots of choice. There's lots of options working out what's important to you, doing your research and going for it. But the short answer is, yes, you can. You can choose as you want to do. Thank you so you never much. never give the short answer, though. That's no fun. <laughs> It'll be so a five-minute live stream. I had to quickly cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> and the edited version will be five minutes long. 
<laughs> okay, so the next one we have is from Angelica. Is it cheaper to live in a campus? And I suppose the other half of that question is going to be compared against a city-based university. So anyone want to... It just depends if you're paying for things like a bus pass, for example, or if you have to get taxis anywhere. So if you are living kind of where everything is there, the city centre is there, the campus is right next to the city centre, like it is a DMU, then you're going to be saving money on transport costs. Cool. Thank you very much, Faye. The next two questions that we receive from Charlie and Ella are very similar so i'm just going to combine those into one and the, the the crux of the question is if lockdown is lifted later this year will university offer opportunities for open days such in october and november yeah uh, yeah absolutely i mean we have september october november december and january lined up as open days obviously it would depend completely upon the covid19 situation and the lockdown guidance but as soon as it is safe to do so for both our staff, our current students, the visitors and the community, we'd love to be able to open the campus up and get people physically onto site to have a look around and to, to go back to normal. I suspect it's going to be step by step by step. And I certainly can't sit here and tell you in October, we will definitely have an on-campus open day. But as soon as we can safely do so, we will definitely be freeing up the opportunity for you guys to come and have a look in person. And I'm sure that lots of other universities do the same, but it's just difficult at this stage to, to have a long, long lens view and work out exactly when that will be. So as soon as it's physically safe to do so, we will definitely start opening the campus up again for, for those types of opportunities. Thank you so much for that, Jamie. So those are our live questions. We did have some questions come through um, when students registered for our talk. And the first one's from Jane, Molly Jane. So what is the jump like from sixth form to university? Well, I can say you can just walk in if you want to. You don't necessarily have to have to jump, um, but hey-ho, whatever you want to do, Molly. So did you prepare that line there, Dan? I like it. I did, I did. I was waiting for this question all day. I thought, yes, I know exactly what I'm going to say when this question comes the up. Highlight of your work from home week that I can tell. <laughs> Make sure we put this in the highlight reel. <laughs> this will be it by itself, 10 seconds. <laughs> So what is the transition like from sixth form to university? I remember finding the first year of university uh, easier than my A-levels, strangely enough. I actually found my A-levels really difficult. But again, that might be because like Jamie, I was just sort of dossed around a little bit. Um, but got to university. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got to university and actually I found the first year quite easy. It does get uh, significantly more difficult as you kind of get to second and third year but I think because you're going from studying what is essentially if you're doing A-levels doing maybe three or four A-levels to essentially focusing down to one particular subject area I think the jump becomes slightly easier and because it eases you in from sort of first year up to second year up to third year I think the jump is fair it is a fairly natural sort of curve um, the other thing you'll find with particularly first year and, and particularly with us is that they won't necessarily always require you to have sort of pre-established knowledge so if you're jumping in and I was in the same situation where I jumped into an IT degree and I wasn't very good at programming I didn't know a lot of programming but there were other people that had done it at college but I hadn't but the, what they did was they just went that's fine we'll get everybody onto the same level in the first sort of few months of first year so everybody's at the first at the same sort of stage and then as they kind of progressed through the first year into second year into third year everybody was at the same pace at the same level and it was it like I say it was that very sort of natural curve for me Thank you for that, Ben. Next question we have, without throwing shade, <laughs> what are the benefits or reasons to choose university to an apprenticeship from Jeanette? Oh, look how no one wants to answer this. No, I think, I think they're very different things. Apprenticeships are primarily work-based. They're also very, very job and role specific. So you're learning a very particular skill in a very particular job. You're essentially training to do that job when you've graduated. Um, you don't get quite the same social experience doing an apprenticeship as what you do to university, but you do get a lot of practical skills as well. Um, also, the other challenge with apprenticeship are there's not actually that many available. We tend to be in particular sectors, in particular local opportunities, but there's nothing, there's no better or worse choice to make. Just like everything else we've talked about, it's about lining up all the different options you've got, 
doing your research and working out what's important to you. And also just to say, at DMU, we do do some, I can never say this, degree apprenticeship, d -d 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 degree apprenticeships. So do check out the website and check out the degree apprenticeships options there, because sometimes you can do both worlds and do an apprenticeship through a university, which gives you both the academic skills and experience and the practical vocational stuff as well. Cool. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jamie. Aisha's asking, can you change your course if it isn't right for you? Yeah, so if you um, start at the university and then you sort of realise that you might prefer a different course or you're maybe not enjoying the course as much as you thought you would, um, there is a small flexibility period. I believe it's two weeks after you start that you can change, change course. Of course, you know, just to manage any expectations, if you want to change onto, uh, you know, say you're studying dance, you want to move on to pharmacy, or if you're studying pharmacy, you want to move on to dance, you're probably not going to be able to do that because you won't, wouldn't have had the sort of um, level three, so A level, B tech access course qualifications that would make you eligible for changing so drastically. But if it's sort of a in faculty change, there tends to not be too many issues with that. Of course, again, if you did want to move on to, say, pharmacy, which is a very competitive course, which wouldn't have the spaces available, then you probably wouldn't be able to. But for example, um, I did mention earlier, one of my flatmates in first year, he actually moved after two weeks. He was initially on the performing arts course. Someone else we made friends with, in fact, two different people we made friends with during Freshers' Week studying dance realized that he preferred the dance element of performing arts and actually wanted to move over to just do that as a solo course so he switched from performing arts over onto dance so if you get the feel that during freshers week or the first two weeks the course isn't right for you you can change over and there may even be an option at the end of your first year to change onto a different course to do the second year but again that would be dependent on the course being relevant so say if it was moving from business management and marketing to just marketing or just business management then that shouldn't be a problem but if you did want to change quite drastically then you might not be able to but of course if you do want to change your course there definitely is the option for you to do that potentially thank you so much for that dave now earlier on in the stream i would have said that we're going to cross to faye for an answer on scholarships faye i have <laughs> not forgot so what kind of scholarships are there and how does the point system work with grades? Um, I mean, the thing is with scholarships um, and bursaries is that you might have to put a re bit of research in to look for them. Um, they are usually scholarships um, are offered through universities directly. Um, bursaries, they might be more um, to do with your personal circumstances. It might be the particular course that you do. So, for example, if you do an NHS course, if you do something like social work or nursing or midwifery, you might find that you're entitled to an NHS bursary to support you with your living costs. So that could be travel. It could just be um, if you can't fit in um, work, for example, then that might be able to help you. So anything that you might get, scholarships, bursaries, they do not have to be repaid. So they're not like your you know, tuition fee loan or your maintenance loan if you take one. Uh, scholarships could be for things like high achievement. So it could be, um, you know, that it's a sports scholarship, something that we do offer at DMU. And it might be that you are playing competitively. Um, so we might offer you um, a package towards that to continuing on your sport. Uh, something that we do here as well is we recognize that if, you know, if you've done really, really well in your A levels or your B techs or whatever it is that you're studying, um, we do offer a DMU Global High Flyer Scholarship. So that's a thousand pounds towards a DMU Global trip. Uh, so a bit of a nice incentive to do well in your exams. It might be your background. If you're a care leaver, if you are studying on an access course, uh, then there are also pots of money available to you as well to not have to pay back. There's other things like travel grants as well. So if you're thinking about doing a year abroad, um, I had to as part of my course, which is what I why I chose it. I did languages. I got grants through companies like, um, you know, 
funded, you know, like Erasmus, for example, they give me free free money on top of my maintenance loan uh, to make sure that I could pay for things like flights, you know, if my accommodation was a little bit more expensive, uh, then that really supported me. So do do a bit of research, get onto university websites and start thinking a little bit outside of the box uh, to make sure that you don't miss out on any free money. Everybody likes money. If you don't, you're more than welcome to uh, pass it over to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Faye. Um, this next question that I've got here, um, I've got a feeling that it's probably applicable to a lot of students who are watching our stream right now. They're not sure on what course or job I want to do. Can you give any tips? <laughs> Um, we want to live stream again later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Evening yeah. Of the fly um, I think just going again, this is something that Jamie picked up on earlier. You know, we're all working in marketing, but we've all come from very, very different backgrounds, as mentioned before. Um, Dow from a sports psychology background, I believe. Make sure I, I got that right. I must have uh, forgot Dow's degree choice. I know. Really. <laughs> I, I noticed how you secretly didn't mention what I do. You went for everyone. Kept it quiet. It me. wasn't a secret. I'd just forgotten. <laughs> uh, Faye from languages, Dave from uh, sort of an events background, and Jamie from business. So there's a real mixture here. So ultimately, if you're not sure what career you want to do, the best advice I would say is if you're looking to go to university because you want that sort of experience as well, is pick something that you enjoy because a lot of the time when you're at university, you gain trans transferable skills from a lot of different areas as we've talked about from your society or whatever it is that can then feed into other career paths that will start to open up as you kind of move through the process so yeah if you're not sure at the minute what you want to do just just kind of go where your your sort of interests lie because that's a really good jumping off point for yourself it was something that i did uh, so i had a really I, I had a big interest in doing stuff like with it i was really good at it or so i thought um so i steered towards that route but then i found that i actually had interest in other areas thank you so much for that ben um one of the final questions that we've got Will sessions be online this year? How will COVID-19 affect me, Sophie? We don't know is the answer at the current point. So obviously, just like every single business, every single education provider, we are looking at the options. We are looking at the guidance. We are taking it week by week. We're having a bit of a long view. I mean, term starts late September, which is what, four and a half months away. A lot can happen in four and a half months, but it's possible there could still be some social distancing rules and regulations. Who knows what's happened? It's even possible there could be a, a second sweep of the virus. We just don't know. So we're looking at plans that will involve full campus teaching as per normal and full social interactions, full campus teaching with some social distancing rules and like regulations in place or slightly delay in the start of term or adding a lot more digital elements to the teaching and learning so it really is too difficult at this stage to say what's going to happen um we're planning contingencies for all sorts of eventualities we'd love to be able to teach fully on campus if we can do so safely this is a similar answer to the open day question earlier we hope so we will attempt to do so, but we'll also look at all sorts of different opportunities and ways of delivering things, and we will do what is the safest, most beneficial, and hopefully positive thing we can do within the circumstances. So Casey, just watch this space. And if you're an applicant or an inquirer, as soon as we know exactly what the situation might be, if anything changes, we'll be in touch directly both via email, and we'll probably give you a phone call just to chat through in a bit more detail. So don't kind of let it worry you do still look forward to university because I think it's going to be great regardless, but some of these decisions will come out over the next month or two as things become a bit clearer in terms of what the government's sort of undoing the lockdown situation is going to be. Very, very politically put there, Jamie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, So just some more here. So just the final ones on YouTube and then we'll wrap up. Um, and <laughs> and he's asking, how do you become a student ambassador at De Montfort University? Um, I'll, I'll add on to what Dave mentioned earlier then. Dave, you mentioned Unitemps earlier. So all of our ambassadors that work for us on our open days, on a lot of the shifts that we run, some of it, some of our students even get involved with things like social media and, and ringing uh, students to talk about their choices, all that sort of stuff. Uh, our student ambassadors are all employed sort of through Unitemps, so they're all paid through our recruitment agency. And uh, that is how you would sort of sign up when you arrived on campus. So we normally do the sort of recruiting for those in the first sort of few weeks of term. 
So whether you're a first, second or third year, you can join as part of the scheme. And it's really good. And I say, no, no, Dave was an ambassador uh, back in the day. Uh, it's really good because it allows you to kind of work through your studies. So if you see a shift pop up that is clashing with a lecture, you can't make, maybe make that one, but you see one in a couple of days time, the way you've got a free day, you can work for the whole day, work that shift and earn a bit of money that way. So being a student ambassador is really, really flexible. And as I say, it's done through our recruitment agency. Thank you so much for that, Ben. And I think we have come to the end of our live stream. We've tried to answer all of the questions that we have. Some of the questions that you guys have posted, we've posted a response in the comments section. So for anything specific on courses, please have a look at the comment section on YouTube and Facebook. But there are there has been a lot of questions around the courses, around the content, around the modules. And our advice would be to, to pop onto our website and order a prospectus. So we'll be able to send that out to you, to your home address, so you can start this research process now and start to have a look at some of the courses that are on offer. From everyone in our team, we just want to say a massive thank you for joining us. We know we've been talking for over an hour, nearly an hour and a half now. So we do thank you for that. And Sanjeev, we also love you too okay so thank you so much for your positivity at least we know you've been listening to us um and we just want to say thank you for joining us anything else you guys want to add before we end guys um I think if there's any questions that we haven't answered in this live stream, as Dow's just mentioned, I've just popped a link in the chat as well to visit what's something called Unibuddy on our website. Um, so we've got current students that are on there. And in fact, myself, Faye and Dal are all on the Unibuddy web page. So you can have a chat with us if you've got any questions about admissions or about uh, time at university, have a chat with one of our students or with one of us, and we should be able to answer them uh, through that. Thank you for that, Ben. Well, from us today, we'd just like to say thank you and bye bye. Well, bye. See you later. Bye, Thanks for tuning in.